Well, okay. I would again like to take a moment to invite you to ask yourself a question. And the question is this. Why am I spending my precious time today watching this? Why do I participate in church at all? Do we attend church out of a sense of obligation? Is it out of habit? Is it because you hope to be inspired or to feel connected to God? Is it because you're exploring your spiritual path and you need some sustenance on your journey? Is it to find community, a place to be of service to others? Is it because you're questioning things or you're curious? Or is it a combination of some or all of the above? So think about that for a moment while I tell you a story. This past week, we held a gathering called Salem 101. It is an introduction to our church for anyone who wants to learn more about us. It's also a sort of refresher course for people who've been around for a while. I started doing Salem 101 about five years ago and have held a session every so often because I think it's really important to know what you might be getting yourself into if you're thinking about joining any kind of organization, but especially a group like a church. Now, Salem 101 is not an indoctrination class, and it is not a prerequisite to becoming a member. And it's not a way of saying to anyone, this is why what we believe and what we do is superior to any other church. Or it's not, if you don't think or believe just like us, then hit the road. But if you do think and believe like us, then please stay. No, Salem 101 is simply basic information, some background, and hopefully you come away from it with a better sense of why we exist as a church in the first place, our cause, our purpose, our reason for being. So it's about that question I ask you to ponder, why we gather together this morning or any other time as a church. The thing is, the word itself, church, that can mean so many different things to so many different people. It can have a really positive meaning. If you're someone who has fond childhood memories of going to church, if church was a place where you felt surrounded by warmth and love and acceptance, and if it was a place where you found that your beliefs about yourself and your relationship with God were in sync. Now, I'm lucky because at least until I was a young adult, that was my experience of church. Where church might feel like more of an obligation. You participate because your family has always gone to church. You have a personal stake in how the church is doing. It makes up an important piece of your identity. But for you and a lot of people, the idea of church may be neither of those things. It might not feel like an obligation, and it might not necessarily conjure up warm and fuzzy feelings. You could belong to the big portion of the population that has a less than positive sense of organized religion. And you're here to see if church might deserve a second chance. You might have experienced some pain and heartbreak or you felt let down or disillusioned by your previous exposure to church. It's very common. Maybe in the church you've seen people behaving like hypocrites or narrow-minded bigots, and you've not wanted any part of that. And I know that feeling very well, and it was one of the many reasons that I stopped going to church when I was younger. Or maybe you might simply feel like you've grown beyond the basic understandings of faith that you once held near and dear, or that you simply took for granted. And although you consider yourself to be a spiritual person, you just haven't been able to find a community of like-minded people anywhere where it feels like you have the freedom to ask questions or to find a path that makes sense and that feels authentic and nurturing and supportive. And that also describes me. I don't know about you, but I can't stand it when I hear pet answers to serious questions or doctrines that I'm supposed to agree with or else I'm not accepted. That kind of stuff really rubs me the wrong way. 
Salem belongs to a very interesting kind of Christian denomination, the United Church of Christ. Now, I don't want to bore you with a long history lesson, but it's important to know what's up with who we are and why we are. And whether you know it or not, I think it might help explain why you're here. The United Church of Christ, or the UCC for short, is a diverse collection of really four distinct traditions that came together over the course of the 19th and 20th centuries and that finally solidified into one large group back in 1959. But way back before that, in the 17 and 1800s, there were several waves of immigrants from Germany and Switzerland who brought their traditions with them. The folks who started Salem belonged to one of those groups who settled throughout Pennsylvania, and they called themselves the German Reformed Churches. Sort of like Lutherans, but not, not quite. About 100 years before that group arrived in America, there were the German Evangelicals, and they were largely war refugees. Those two groups eventually merged. For one thing, they all spoke German. <laughs> That's why for many years... Salem was known as an evangelical reformed church. They dropped the German from the name around the time World War I broke out because it just wasn't popular in those days to be known as German anything. Meanwhile, up in New England, the much older Puritan churches became less and less Puritan and a whole lot more liberal. They had long abandoned their more distasteful practices things like hanging people accused of witchcraft. Instead, they embraced things like the abolitionist movement and wild new ideas like transcendentalism. Quite a turnaround for those guys. And then, in the early 1800s, there were completely new churches springing up in wild frontier places like Ohio and Kentucky that were also very congregational in nature, meaning... We have guns, and no one can tell us what to do on our property. Some of them were kind of holy rollers for their day. They were rugged individualists, wearing coonskin caps like Davy Crockett. They believed a lot in the idea of unity for all Christians and doing away with things like denominations all together. So, naturally, they formed their own denomination, but they insisted Oh, we're not a denomination, so they tossed out any labels by just calling themselves Christians. And that bunch, by the way, um, were very close cousins to the kind of church that I grew up in, which must explain my love of banjo music. Weirdly enough, that rather rustic band of frontier dwellers and the group of comparatively stuck-up Harvard-educated New Englanders really took a liking to each other, and they became the Congregationalist Christians. Fast forward through the 20th century and all of those aforementioned groups decided to unite. The German Reformed Churches on the one hand and the Congregationalist Christian Churches on the other. It wasn't easy. A huge part of the agreement they had was that each church had the right to hang on to its own unique way of doing things based on their particular traditions as long as everyone agreed to support the idea of Christian unity. It was like a real-time science fair experiment because one way of being a church, and you might have grown up in a church just like this, assumes that, well, you, you've always got a local congregation, of course, but it's bound by rules and regulations and doctrines that are dictated from on high by higher-ups, by people like bishops and such. But the other way of being the church is that you're completely, or more or less, independent, and you do not need to answer to any higher-ups, assuming there even are any higher-ups. So no one had ever really tried that before, this kind of merger, and getting the various church leaders to agree on how all this would work was a challenge, to say the least. And to be honest, 63 years later, it's still a work in progress. But let's think back to when all that happened in 1959 in post-World War II America. Because back in those days, belonging to a church was just what you did 
if you wanted to be regarded as a respectable member of society, it was a cultural expectation. It didn't matter where you went to church, as long as you went to church. But since then, the planet has traveled around the sun many, many times, and things have changed. I mean, you know, today, when you're at the grocery store, in the, in the background, they're, they're playing rock and roll music, of all things. It's shocking. And it's less and less our reality that anyone these days feels obligated to claim any kind of religious affiliation at all. People may say they're spiritual, but they don't really want to be tied down to any particular brand of faith. Another big change happened within the United Church of Christ itself. A cross-pollination of ideas and practices among all those traditions that came together back in the 1950s. And with that came an increasing amount of diversity and change. So that means that in some UCC churches that were once more traditional in their approach to things like worship, they're not so traditional any longer. And you can find regional differences. You can travel from a place, let's say, like Pennsylvania, where many churches still practice a more formal and traditional and what is called a high church liturgical style of worship, and then go visit a Sunday service at a UCC church, let's say, in Colorado, and you might not even recognize you're part of the same denomination. So that's the history of the United Church of Christ in a nutshell. But there's still the question of why I asked you to ask yourself why you're here. What does any of that glorious church history have to do with you and me? Pretty much everything, I think. Because if nothing else, this is a church and we're a tradition that is made up of spiritual mutts. We are not purebreds. The nature of who we are is that we're always changing from generation to generation, year to year, and even week to week as new people join us. Our very nature is that we come from a wide variety of places and backgrounds and faith traditions. We really have no doctrines we require anyone to follow in order to belong, other than loving each other the best we can and doing our best to pay attention to how Jesus lived and what he said, and living that out as best we can. Now, the Apostle Paul once said the same thing when he wrote to the early Christian community in Corinth. He told them that the thing that they had going for them, and the thing we all have going for us, is freedom. He said, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And the way I understand that is, we're all here for our own unique reasons. We all come from different backgrounds, whether you're a lifelong churchgoer, or you once were, but you've come back, or you've never been part of a faith community before. Regardless, your history matters. But then again, those things are not distinctions that divide us. They define us. We're all mutts together. We're all seeking assurance, acceptance, belonging, nurture, understanding, and the freedom to walk our own path with the help of friends that we can count on. We all have freedom. The freedom to be who we are. And the freedom to change. Because history shows, and God knows, the church itself changes so much over time. And that's okay. It's nothing to fear. After all, if God is the creative force in the universe, doesn't it make sense that God is still creating, still speaking, still working through you and me in brand new ways? So I believe God is just fine with how we evolve. We're still loved. We still belong. We still serve. We still grow. That is why I am here, and I hope it's why you're here too. And knowing that, believing in that spirit, that's freedom.